Welcome to Dialogue Podcast. I'm your host, Rebecca Sebastian. This is the true crime interview podcast where I kill the small talk with the leading voices in crime, culture, and justice. So happy to be back for another new episode. We are continuing on our series called Crime Conversations. That's basically just me talking with people I met at CrimeCon. Crime Conversations. Very simple. And today's is a really good one. You might already be familiar with her work. I was, but I had never met her until CrimeCon. Who am I speaking about? Cheryl McCollum, known to many as simply Mac. She is a crime analyst, college professor, author, founder, and director of the nonprofit Cold Case Investigative Research Institute based in Atlanta, Georgia. Her crime scene investigation work has actually earned her an Emmy Award for her work on CSI Atlanta. And if you go to my Instagram, you will see a photo of me holding her Emmy, which she brought to CrimeCon and allowed people to touch and hold. Believe you me, I sure did hold that thing with a vice grip. (laughs) Hope to have one of my own someday. Now, I met Cheryl at CrimeCon specifically at an event on, I think it was the Friday night, the first official night of the event. Cheryl was slated to host the Paul Holes book party, the book launch party, and it was also a roast of Paul Holes. I was also scheduled in that event to host Paul Hull's themed trivia. Uh, Again, I will direct you to my Instagram for some fun highlights as well as my TikTok. It'll be in the show notes moments of that evening. So I wanted to mention that because I I joke with her about making sexy Paul Hull's jokes. And it is in reference to that night. She was an excellent MC and host, and she really did roast Paul in the most uh, sincere and lovely way. I am really excited for you to hear this conversation. She's really a Southern storyteller at heart. I could listen to this woman talk for hours. In fact, I would like to have her on for a part two. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Cheryl Mack McCollum. You can learn more about Cheryl and her work in the show notes. Cheryl McCollum, welcome to Dialogue Podcast. Very nice to see you today. Thank you. I've been looking forward to this, huh? Me too. It was really great to finally meet you in person at CrimeCon Las Vegas, where you were a busy woman <laughs> that weekend. We were all busy. I tell Ooh. you, I mean, I saw a lot of incredible people. It was fabulous. Yeah, going in a lot of directions. There was a lot going on. This is the series I'm doing called Crime Conversations. So it's people I met at CrimeCon and we're having these conversations uh, and you were one of them. And what's cool is your work is really connected to the big themes I kept hearing at CrimeCon this, uh, mm-hmm. this last round, this 2022 event. Genetic genealogy, DNA, cold case research. I mean, that's always important at CrimeCon, but um, lots of breakouts about it. I was doing some hosting for the virtual at-home audience, a lot of speakers uh, talking about that. So that's like your wheelhouse. That is your space. So could you (laughs) talk about how your career led you to start the CCIRI, Cold Case Investigative Research Institute? Let's, Let's start there. Okay. I was working for Sheriff D. Stewart down in Spalding County, and I was starting his cold case squad for him. And at night, my part-time job was teaching college. So I had a class, an investigations class, that was from 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. So when you're, when you're trying to engage adults that have already worked all day for four more hours, it's difficult when you've got theory and other junk you're trying to throw in there. Um, And they always don't know how it's applicable. And so they get bored and then you give them that first break and honey, they're ghosts, you know? So I asked the sheriff, I said, look, if I could, we have a double homicide. And if I redact everything, can I take that murder box to my class and then literally give that, you know, case to them and say, look, from this day forward until this you know, class ends, this semester's over, this is your case. And either you can come up with some solvability factors or you can't. Um, But each, you know, chapter that we go over, you're going to apply that to something in that box. So that's what I did. So that first night, when I tell you, I did, I dropped it right in the middle of the class. I said, this isn't a mock. This is real victims, a real double homicide, real families, a real case. And if you come up with something for us to try, we'll do it. So wow. you will actually be a part of this. 
I had to throw them out of class <laughs> at midnight. Do you hear oh me? My gosh. They did not want to leave. Of course. So then I thought, well, I have screwed up and I am on to something. <laughs> so then I called a couple of buddies of mine, uh, one at Faulkner University, who was a former FBI profiler, and another one at the University of uh, or Auburn University, Montgomery, um, who did crime analysis and, you know, staging. So I thought, well, they'll be two good folks to bring in two completely different schools, mm -hmm. completely different, you know, wheelhouses. And I thought if we work this together, but separate, you know, at the same time, if we come up with the same suspect, I'll put my reputation on it. And so that's what we started to do. And that was 2004 officially. And then that matriculated. Yeah. And then that matriculated into the nonprofit because we, we realized pretty quick, there are crime scenes we need to get experts to. There are people that we need to offer a polygraph. We need to do some age progression. We need to do some, you know, DNA testing. So we need money. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we turned it into a nonprofit so that we could do fundraising. And was there any resistance? It sounds like everyone you reached out to was super excited to collaborate and open this information you, up. It has been one of the greatest career elements, I guess, of my life, because I can tell you since 2004, I've had one person turn me down. Wow. One. And let me tell you, that person had just got a coveted judgeship and could not. Oh, okay. So it wasn't okay. like a, nope. a no. It wasn't an actual no. It was a couldn't. And it wasn't a no. It was a couldn't. And yeah. it was one of those things, call me on Saturday. We'll talk about it anyway. You know, got it. But they couldn't got officially it. do anything. It's so encouraging to hear. And now when you started this, your official role, were you a crime analyst at that point? And can you tell us like what exactly that is? Sure. So even today, I'm still an active crime scene investigator. That's okay. what I do for a living. Okay. The Institute, and I think this, this is important for your folks to know, none of us are paid. Okay. When I first started, you know, I had people like Dr. Facitelli that made $375 an hour. And then I might have, you know, a local homicide detective that makes a little less than that. So I couldn't figure out how to legitimately pay these folks because I didn't have $375, you know, paid Dr. Facitelli, but I didn't want to, you know, tell that homicide detective, you're not worth $375. Right. Um, so here's your normal, you know, $26 an hour pay. So we just decided, you know what, I'm Episcopalian. I think you should do the right thing for the right reason at the right time. And it will come back to you. So I just thought nobody's getting paid. And if anybody needs to be paid, then we're not the right organization. Um, Cause one, we ain't got no money. And two, <laughs> um, again, I didn't know how to make it fair. Yeah. So to speak. You know, because I didn't want to insult anybody on either direction, you know. Right. So you removed that barrier for yep. equity. And if Absolutely. people can participate, then they can. If they Correct. can't, then, then and that didn't stop anybody at right. all. Not yeah. one person balked in any way. Again, super encouraging. Glad to hear yes. that's not the motivator and it shouldn't be. And it shouldn't be. And it shouldn't be, not that people shouldn't be compensated be for their clear. skills. Yes. That's a distinction. Say, yes. Absolutely. I was going to be clear. There ain't nothing wrong with getting paid. Absolutely not. And, and I think this for artists too. I think about that a lot, right? Like oh, an absolutely. artist should be paid for their work. Mm -hmm. People always want to take mm -hmm. advantage of creatives. Yes. Um, it, it's more like in the spirit of altruism to help out with a skill set you have sure. if you can. And no harm if you can't financially make that. And listen, I know a ton of people that have started similar type things for profit. Sure. Do it. Sure. To me, and I explain it usually to people, it's like a marriage. What works for me and my husband yeah. may not work for other people in their marriage. Right. right. But that's groovy. Right. You know, if y'all want separate bank accounts and separate vacations, do it. I don't want that. Yeah. You know, if you it's want great, to make sexy jokes about Paul Holes in front of your husband, that's Absolutely. fine. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> that's where you shine. Um, <laughs> and let me tell you, some of that wasn't a joke. But go ahead. <laughs> Roll tape. No, just kidding. No, um, I adore that man. And let me tell you, I'm glad you brought him up. He's another one. So let's talk about him for a minute. Okay. Here he comes off the Golden State Killer. Yeah. Then he has all this, you know, spotlight on him and becomes Paul Holes, right? Yeah. 
and he's got TV shows and he's got books and he's got all these things. That man answered my phone call. Amazing. And not only did he call me back, he walked a case with me, the entire case from the minute that I knew anything about it to where we were when I talked to him. And he said, look, this is what I think you can do. And he said, I will even go on CSI Atlanta with you and Karen Greer. Let's talk about it. Let's get some publicity out there. Wow. And if I can help do that, that's great. So again, Paul didn't want no money. Right. Paul's never asked me for anything. Yeah. Um, but gracious, gracious and kind and smart. So again, he offered everything he possibly had. So yeah. to me, it was amazing. So beautiful. I love it. Mm -hmm. Now, crime scene investigator, who employs you? The state of Georgia? Who? I work for a local police department. Local police department. Okay. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to understand. So that. I'm a part of CID. Okay. And, um, you know, so we do all the, you know, murders, rapes, armed robberies, carjackings, really anything. If you even have your car broken into, I mean, I'll go fingerprint. It doesn't have to be a major case at all. And did you always know you wanted to do that? What Absolutely. Do you, what Absolutely. did that look like? How did that manifest as a kid and an adolescent? What was obvious in you that now makes sense? And your family goes, oh, yeah, of course she's doing that. Well, when I was little, um, Atlanta, if you got about 100 miles away, the radio stations no longer worked after 10 o'clock at night. Mm -hmm. So when we would travel, my mother would tell us just these fantastic stories. So one of the stories she told us was Bonnie and Clyde. Oh. And I became captivated. And I was four years old. And I couldn't understand, number one, why my parents didn't do that. Because to me, that was logical. And I'm like, they're in love. Y'all are in love. They're just going to go get some money. Y'all go get some money. Now, she didn't tell us the whole story. Mm -hmm. She told us part of the story. And she told like, you know, the one time they went in the bank and the farmer was standing there and he was like, man, that's all the money I got in the world. And he's like, why are you trying to take your money here? Keep it. Right. Yeah. She didn't tell us about the death car yet. That came later. But um, when I was eight years old, they took me to see the death car and the man that owned it let me sit in it. Now, I didn't know anything about, you know, trajectory and all that at the time, but I knew when he let me sit in it, as tiny as I was, there was nowhere I could sit. There wasn't multiple bullet holes. So I'm like, there ain't no way they survived this. I mean, this was too much, you know. You um, remember having that conscious thought? I can tell you what the car smelled like. Absolutely. Because I kept wiggling, trying to think, you know, could they have gotten the floorboard? Could they yeah. have crawled in the back seat? Honey, there wasn't nowhere they could go at oh all. And you have to remember, I was kind of a fan of theirs. I was for four years in that mindset, you know, oh, I hope they get away. Mm. I didn't really understand everything. Like I, I learned it in stages. You know what I mean? Right. So, so you were almost operating out of confirmation bias mm -hmm. and then being sitting in the real space changed your way of thinking because you had the physicality and the tangible experience to change right. your mindset of what could have happened instead right. of based on what you wanted to happen. Right. And then like at 12, my parents took me to Alcatraz because by then, oh. you know, Al Capone, you know, was on my radar as, you know, well as the Birdman of Alcatraz and other yeah. folks. And then of course the escape. So yeah. there was just lots of things. So they fed that. They did. They um, nurtured even it. it. was. They did, even though it was really unusual. There weren't a lot of women to watch, I would imagine, when you were a young girl in law enforcement. Uh, there was zero until yeah. a police woman. Right, yeah. right. Angie Dickinson was the first one. Wow. Okay, yeah. so I read that early in your career were a uh, crisis counselor at Grady yes. Hospital, which it's right. itself is a is an institution. So here's what happened with that. Okay. I was so desperate. I wanted to work real cases and get into law enforcement. Um, but I was just turning 18 and you had oh to be 21. Gosh. So I thought, where could I work? Well, Grady Rape Crisis Center, you could volunteer and you work directly with a sex crimes detective. And you oftentimes were the one that interviewed the victim. So oh you gosh. wrote an actual report that would help that detective. So that's what I did. So I signed up for the 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. shift. And Walt, um, my husband, who was my high school boyfriend and college boyfriend, he would come to Grady and we would go up on the roof and we'd hang out and then they would page me if they needed me. 
So I imagine this as like a post-grad kind of situation. You were a high schooler. Yeah. <laughs> Just so, and that's yeah. so interesting too, because it's a very victim centric role. Mm-hmm. So that probably informed so much of your future work. Mm-hmm. I, I learned how to write reports. I learned how to really listen to victims. I learned how to, hey, wait a minute. I had a case four months ago where the woman mentioned a purple screwdriver. Hold on a second. Right. And then I would help them. Oh my you gosh. Know? So it was, it was tremendous. And then, of course, when things weren't, really happening in the rape crisis center that emergency room you know gunshot wounds stab wounds yeah stab with a pitchfork hatchet in the head I mean I got to see a ton and so I was able to understand wounds and recognize certain wounds and things like that so I wouldn't give anything for my time at Grady it was absolutely fantastic my daughter's about to start a, a summer internship at a hospital here in New York mm-hmm. in an ER and she can't mm-hmm. wait. And I think there's, there's two kinds of people, you know, the ones that want to be around yep. that and the ones that yep. don't. And, yep. you know, thank God for it. Well, you know, to kill a mockingbird, some of yeah. us are chosen for the unpleasant jobs. I mean, yes. it's just true. Yes. Yeah. And, and everybody can find their way of helping. That's what's so beautiful. I think about true yes. crime and the way it's expanding. You meet all mm-hmm. these different peoples. And on my podcast, I talk about so, to talk so many different people doing different, justice work in all these different places and amazing they're all Mm -hmm. necessary right Mm -hmm. um so going back to this this class you created for these these night college students you mentioned solvability factors and that's something Mm -hmm. i've seen a thread in your on your website and your work Mm -hmm. can you define solvability factor and what you're talking about when you say that what should we be looking for if if we look at a case and we say oh wait a minute with Boston Strangler, mm-hmm. they did everything they could think of to do at the time, but they didn't know anything about geographical profiling. That's something we yeah. can do for them. Okay. So that might be a solvability factor that if we could break that down and say the person that did these crimes most likely lives or works right here. And does right. that then match Albert DeSalvo? That's something okay. we can do. Um, has somebody made a statement that we can get a statement analyst of ours to look at to say, wait a minute, this shows deception right here. Mm-hmm. Why would he be deceptive about when he called 911? Right. So anything we can give that detective that maybe they do not have access to. So most apartments, for example, don't have a psychopathologist. We do. Most apartments don't have ground penetrating radar. We do. And it doesn't cost them anything. It doesn't cost right. the family anything. So again, the man that owns the ground penetrate radar, he gets paid for looking at pipes and other things under the ground for major construction companies and people that are building high rises and that sort of thing. But if I call him and say, hey, can you go to this backyard? Then he'll do it for us again for nothing. Wow. You know, we've got folks that have, you know, canines and different advocations or vocations that could help us understand what we're looking at. So we've got a lot of help, a lot of really unbelievably, you know, gifted and brilliant people that are willing, you know, to, again, answer that phone call and do whatever they can. And it's amazing because we know that a lot of smaller law enforcement agencies and departments are Mm under-resourced. Is this a model you're seeing across the country where these independent organizations can support and augment a department? Are, are Absolutely. The, is, is it getting more common? Do you know? Oh, it's getting a lot more common. When okay. we first started in 2004, people are like, what are you talking about? Mm-hmm. Well, then you have people come along. And I learned through CrimeCon the term, uh, what, uh, what do they call it? Uh, CrowdSol. Yeah, I've never heard that term. Yeah. We had been doing it. Right. We've been doing it for, you know quite some time, but I'd never heard that term. Sure. I'm like, wait a minute. That is awesome that you've coined that term and you're doing it. Yes. And there you go. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to say one more thing about that. I have had people literally come up to me and they say, Hey, aren't you mad at so-and-so? Cause they ripped off your idea. Okay. (laughs) Uh, First of all, I don't know that anybody ripped off my idea ever. I think two people can have a similar idea and not even know each other. It happens Uh all the time. Yeah. If they did rip me off, good, do it. There are enough cases and enough victims and you can call around to a ton of podcasts and a ton of organizations and a ton of experts. I will literally give you our playbook. 
And if there's something you like, use it. If there's something you don't really, it doesn't groove you, throw it out. Right. That's the way it should be. This sense of entitlement over things and ownership is so problematic. Yeah. And it happens uh, among podcasters who get very attached to one case and cover sure. it. Sure. Sure. That they don't want to let another source in. And I think like, is everyone still remembering what the the goal here is, you know, like solving right. a case, justice for a victim. And I think when you lose sight of that, of course, your our ego can prevail when we lose sight of the bigger yep. mission, right? Sure. So there's also, there is nothing new under the sun. I mean, like you said, people have been doing things for a long time and sometimes people give it a name and a form. Sure. And then that spreads and that's, that's Absolutely. beautiful. It is a great thing. It's yeah. a great thing. Now, one of the places where I get very overwhelmed at CrimeCon is like new technology and even genetic <laughs> genealogy. I'll have, sure. I've had people break it down to me several times and I still have to like really focus to stay with it. But in your space, in your work, mm -hmm. is there anything happening right now or on the horizon technology wise that's mm -hmm. just changing the game? Are you familiar yes. with MVAT? Yes. I watch okay. Forensic Files. So yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So Jared Bradley's daddy invented this thing that can extract DNA off a rock. Yes. So it used to be, we would say, oh, that's porous. There's nothing we can do with it. We're done. Right. Not anymore. So that MVAT can get that DNA. So let's say that sample is not quite enough to get a full profile, Dr. Middleman can do it. Wow. If you've got DNA where your state crime lab has said, oh, that's degraded, we can't get a profile, Dr. and Dr. Middleman can do it. So they have invented this machine, and I do not understand it. Yeah. I okay. can't break it down any more than this. They can take those samples and get enough from that sample to get a complete DNA profile. They are solving cold cases every single day, oh sometimes gosh. three or four a day. <laughs> so, yeah, when you've got somebody like uh, Jared Bradley with the MVAT or Francine Bardot with the Bardot method, do you know Francine? Absolutely. I do not. No, tell She's me. She's a genius. So, you know, when you have uh, like a diamond or something and you take it to the jewelry store yeah. and they put it in that little contraption and it shakes like yes. crazy? She has something similar where she can put spent shell casings now, hear me, spent shell casings, and put it inside there and shake it up. And under the groove, the cap of that shell casing, there's DNA. Because when you take your thumb and you load that weapon, there's quite possibly touch DNA in there. Well, we have always been told because that weapon, you fire it, there's literally fire. Mm -hmm. Then the DNA's all burn up. Not true. Oh Get it gosh. to Francine Bardot. Okay. So between Jared and Francine, they can get samples to Dr. Middleman that literally is changing the, not just cold cases, um, but you can use the MVAT on active cases. It's, it's no bigger than, you know, a microwave. Right. So how close are we to this being deployed currently and consistently? Is it just terribly expensive? Who has access to this right now? It's not terribly expensive. Jared has made it his mission to try to get most state labs to have it. Wow. Here's the issue. The issue becomes most detectives do not know about the impact. Really? Most crime scene investigators don't know about Francine Bardol or Dr. Middleman. So when they get their evidence back and send it to the crime lab, they don't even know to ask for that test. Okay. So you only you only ask for what you know. Of course. And so that's part of what we're doing. That's why this dialogue is important. Yes. That's why going to crime con is important. So that when, you know, these people walk by and you, I go, hey, you're in uniform. Do you know what that is over there? No, I don't know what that is. Go talk to that boy over there. <laughs> and I mean, then there you go. Yeah, I feel like almost every crime con attendee would know what an MVAC is, probably because of the same reason I do, which is yeah. Forensic Files featured and an episode where they used it. Yeah, they're like 30 grand. They're yeah. less than a police car. Oh, my gosh. It so feels it, like it, it should be every, standard issue. Every police department should have one. Oh and I gosh. think like crime con in Orlando, I think there's going to be enough attendees. We could raise $30,000 and give one to the host city police department. I love and every that city idea. we go to, here's an in that. Because if we had 5,000 people there, yeah, I mean, what are you talking about? That ain't yeah. no money. And we yeah. could all bring stuff to raffle off. We could raise $30,000. For sure. Could. I love that idea because what a legacy to leave 
as yes. crime cons footprint. Like that's, and that's and so you know, cool. There's a lot of people that would want to give that won't of even course. maybe be at crime con. And then they will know too. I did that. Exactly. I Every exactly. single case that Orlando PD solves with an MVAT, I did that. I agree. Right. People would be happy to be a part of that. Yes. Dialogue podcast is sponsored in part by She's Birdie. I love She's Birdie. What is She's Birdie? It's a personal alarm that is most importantly, easy to use and effective. The alarm is loud and easy to activate when you need to, but impossible to activate accidentally. This is really important. It's also not a hard plastic. It has that kind of silicone, soft, velvety cover around it. So it doesn't slip and slide all over the place. It's got a nice grip in your hand. Not as important, but worth mentioning, they're really cute. The founders worked hard to design a product that you don't mind wearing on your handbag or gym bag or car keys. Each one comes with a beautiful brass ring and the alarms themselves come in really fun colors, but also a dark charcoal, which reads as black, which is definitely the one I have. But right now they came out with new spring designs, including blue with little flowers, white with little strawberries, super adorable designs. And if all of that weren't enough, She's Birdie gives back every time you buy one. To date, they've given over $50,000 to local women's shelters and assist in changing legislation to protect victims of abuse and violence. Don't wait. Prepare yourself and the people you love with a She's Birdie personal alarm now. Dialogue listeners get 10% off when they use the code DIEHARD. Go to She'sBirdie.com and use the code DIEHARD, D-I-E-H-A-R-D, for 10% off at checkout. That 10% applies even on top of a sale. There's just no reason not to have a She's Birdie. Again, it's She'sBirdie.com, code DIEHARD. So you've had so much influence and direct Mm -hmm. connection on cases that are Mm -hmm. very recognizable and high profile. I'd love to talk about a couple of them. Natalie Holloway. These are the ones that stood out to me. And Natalie Wood, all of whom (laughs) whose outcomes are so Mm. debated still. So let's start with Natalie Holloway. What was your involvement in that case formally or not? Uh, I'll start with one quick thing. We don't ever release our findings however okay it's funny you mentioned natalie holloway because um, we don't ever release our findings and we don't ever name a suspect natalie was the first time we violated our own rule Hmm. and the reason we did that is once we got involved we got involved late 2005 okay um started working with beth you know trying to help her understand conceptually what most likely happened okay and um we believed and still do that she was put in the ocean mm. um and then very quickly beth started had it you know having these people come to her oh they found a bloody mattress they found a bone they found a grave um they believe somebody put her in an existing grave in the cemetery yeah. they found hair that had to be natalie's all these things so we tried to walk her through, that, look, if you believe that Natalie was murdered, like we do, the hair that was found would have the death band on it. I can visually tell you this person was a lot. It's not going to match you. But if that's something you need to do, then we will have it tested. But mm-hmm. these people are con artists. They're trying to get money out of you. Um, so when we were doing all of our research, um, we had a profiler and a psychopathologist and a crime analyst that came to the same conclusion. And that was that your hand bander salute would reoffend within five years. Mm -hmm. So we put that information out Mm -hmm. and unfortunately we were right Mm -hmm. um, that he killed, you know, Stephanie Flores five years to the day. Nancy Grace and I and Beth went back to Aruba not too long ago. And people were asking me, why in the world would you go back? You already know we did it. This is not an unsolved case. Mm. It's not an unsolved case. It's an unproven case. And Beth is still getting con artists. She had somebody send her a bone and said it was Natalie's shoulder. And then an expert had the nerve to contact her and say, we will tell you whether or not that's Natalie for $10,000. Okay. Beth's a school teacher, y'all. I want you to understand. She's a school teacher. Yes, she's very public. Yes, she's, you know, had this little show for a short, short period of time. She's a school teacher on school teacher money. 
Okay. But she's a mama. Uh huh. Okay. Exactly. So she would have paid it. So yep. I said, give me that bone. <laughs> and I've got a forensic um, anthropologist that literally did this. The bone was in a box. She opened the box and she went, it's not human. What else she got? Oh, jeez. So we Can don't you- need no DNA test, y'all. We don't need some highfalutin, you know, machine to tell us whether or not that's Natalie. But here's the thing about Beth. She knows. Yeah. She knows what happened to her. Yeah. She knows the likelihood of it not being murder is so astronomical that we don't even really ever have that conversation. Right. However, she says to me, we're in Aruba now. And she's, you know, very upfront and forthright. She says, Cheryl, I know, I know what happened to Natalie. But do you know, I still carry her passport just in case I can bring her home. My gosh. And that's why we do what we do. Yeah. Just in case. I just interviewed uh, David Robinson, father of missing geologist Daniel mm-hmm. Robinson in mm-hmm. Arizona. It's like, mm-hmm. I think exploiting the a parent of a potentially murdered or missing person is like maybe one of the most deplorable things I can think of. And yet, I, and also it's because these are smart people in such agony. Of course, you'd pay someone ten thousand dollars for a possible answer, First. even when you have a deep knowing inside of you. Yes. How how could you say no? Because what if? And right, it's it's beyond heartbreaking. Mm-hmm. Um, so, as a practice, though, you don't release your findings when something is still considered active or open. Is that Correct. the caveat? Correct. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So then, I don't know if you can speak on Natalie Wood. Natalie Wood was interesting to me because the cause of mm-hmm. death was changed decades yes. later. I thought yes. that was really interesting. Can you just? Talk a little sure. bit about that change from, um, I guess it went from a drowning to yeah, an accidental unknown. to yeah. undetermined. Yeah. And that was critical because if something is ruled an accident, your local law enforcement can't investigate it. Mm-hmm. There's nothing to investigate. Right. So you're not going to have one sheriff or one chief of police go, oh, yeah, go spend your time on a case that's <laughs> not a case. Right. Okay. So it was imperative that that get changed. And I will tell you, working with her sister, Lana, um, Lana is old school Hollywood, right? The golden age. Yeah. She talks like it. She dresses like it. She understands it. Um, she understands, you know, her relationship with Sean Connery. And she'll talk about that like I would when my husband and I went to prom. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just crazy. And I'm like, yeah. Girl, you're talking about Sean Connery. (laughs) It's another world. Yeah. Oh my God. And, um, you know, she loved her sister and her sister was not just a sister, but she gave her her career. She gave her her standing. She gave her for all intents and purposes, this life that was glamorous and wonderful. And Natalie was generous and kind. Um, And when she died the way she did and then all communication was cut off with rj um it was hard for her to understand why that would happen mm-hmm. and then there's some questions that she had that were legitimate that have never been answered um why would you not turn search lights on why yeah. would you not call the coast guard um when you entertain the fact that natalie tried to get in a dinghy which you as her husband would know damn well, that would never happen Right. for two reasons. When she's found, she's found in a um, flannel nightgown. Okay. I ain't no movie star and I'm not, you know, high society, but I wouldn't want nobody to find me in a flannel nightgown. Yeah. Natalie yeah. would. And let me tell you, I'll give your listeners one thing. Try to find a bad picture of that woman. Mm-mm. You can't do it. Mm-mm, There's not exist. a picture where she's making a weird face. Right. There's not a picture with her mouth open eating. Right. There's not a picture. I, I found one where her eyes are kind of closed, but that's after looking at about mm, 50,000 pictures. Mm-hmm. And the reason I point that out is Natalie was hypersensitive to the fact that she was Natalie Wood. Right. She would not go out to her own swimming pool without full makeup and hair done. Yeah. So 
a flannel nightgown, she was not fixing to go to town. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. just not yeah. feasible. You know what I mean? How difficult and or common is it to get a case uh, status changed? Because that actually reminds me of David Robinson's goal right now, too. He has a petition yeah. that I just signed that I'm sharing with my listeners to change it from a missing persons case to a criminal investigation because of some evidence they found mm-hmm. and some things on the scene that he believes and, and he admits I'm his dad. I am biased. But he wants sure. it to be investigated as a as a potential crime scene that he he went missing sure. at a potential crime scene. Is it very hard to do to change those statuses? It's very rare. Yeah, it's very rare. But again, he's got a lot of folks behind him now. And again, yeah. that's another reason crime con, crime con, crime con. I sometimes see people say things like, "Oh, y'all are just selling T-shirts and wine and whatever." Have you ever been to crime con? Right. I mean, you're missing the whole gig. And if people are selling shirts, it's to either offset the cost of going there Mm -hmm. or to raise money to do something on a case that needs to be done. Yeah. So for him, what's going to be critical is whatever was found, not to let them explain it away. Right. He's got to articulate why it's important. Yeah. Um, And if he's biased, that's fine. But facts are facts. Yes. Yes. So that's going to be really important. And it's going to be important for all of us to stay in that conversation with him. Yes. And when I was at CrimeCon, Jim Clemente said something so powerful that I'm going to share it with you. Good. Because I promised him from from that moment he said it forward, I will never say they're missing. They're a missing person. Mm. They're an endangered person person wow yes yes as soon as you flip that because missing you're like yeah maybe they just walked off you know are they really missing or did they get drunk and just pass out somewhere and they're going to show back up right yeah um so to me it's imperative that he explain his son he has to make him real to us we need to feel like we knew him so that we can say "Mm, he's endangered yeah. You know, a hiker in that same desert where where this boy Daniel went missing, mm-hmm. if they're gone, if they don't make it back by sundown, police search for them. I mean, that hiker is considered endangered because mm-hmm. of the elements and the terrain of where that physical space is. Correct. The fact that this isn't directly translating and this case is so bizarre to me. I know we're getting in the weeds on it, but it's just no, top but of it, mind because it, it was just this week. But And that's the thing. He's it, in danger. He's not he's missing. Da- right, right. That's so, that's good. That's a good word from, from Jim mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, This really jumped out at me and I wanted to talk about it. The Moore Ford lynchings. Can you talk sure. about that historical yes. moment in the South that I actually admittedly didn't know about. Well, let me tell you what we did on that case and you'll, you'll dig it. Please okay, do. So, so give the background of the original incident and then like all these okay. years later, you're involved. So, a, a buddy of mine, state representative Tyrone Brooks, he came to me and he said, look, you're doing all these cold cases. Why don't you take on the Moores Ford bridge? I said, I don't know about the Moores Ford bridge. Tell me about it. So he did. One of the most critical parts was um, it was July 25th, 1946 in, you know, rural Georgia out in the middle of a little bitty town. And um, there were two families, the Malcolms and the Dorseys, and they worked for the largest landowner in Georgia, okay. in that county. And um, Miss Malcolm was beautiful. And Mr. Malcolm was jealous Well, one day a a white farmer picked her up and kind of twirled her around and Mr. Malcolm just lost it and ran over and cut him across the stomach. Well, he was arrested and for 11 days stayed in jail. Now, the whole time, Miss Malcolm and Miss Dorsey were asking, please let him out. If you don't let him out, they're going to go get him and lynch him. Mm. If that farmer had died that first night, they would have done that, but they weren't sure what to do since he was still alive. So the landowner, Lloyd Harrison, says, I'm not going to go get him. I ain't going to do it. And this goes on for 11 days. All of a sudden, out of the blue, Lloyd Harrison says, I'm going to go get him. Y'all all go get in the car. Oh, gosh. So he got Miss Malcolm, Miss Dorsey, and Mr. Dorsey in the car, and they were going to go to town, pay the bond, and 
than what he would have done. He would have gone back to the farm. He would have had to pay off the bail money. So essentially he's working for free until that's paid off. Mm -hmm. What happens is your room and board, you also have to pay. Mm -hmm. If you break a tool, you got to pay for that hammer or whatever. So the upshot is you don't ever get out yeah. of that debt. You're it's indebted. It's possible. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then if you have a baby, the baby assumes your debt and it's a you know generational thing at that point. So when they leave, the Harrison farm is here and the jail is here. They take the long way home to the Morris Ford Bridge. When they get to the Morris Ford Bridge, there's about 50 cars on there. And they stop him, they get the couple out, they drag them down a ravine, and all four are shot over a hundred times. Oh my gosh. So we decided um, that we needed to excavate that land. So there's an archeologist at Kennesaw, and I was like, you know, doctor, will you please come help us? And he was like, of course. So he comes down there with some of his students from Kennesaw. Another archeologist from Georgia State University came out. Uh, my own children helped cut down trees and clear the land and get rid of wow. trash and move everything. They gritted that thing off just like Indiana Jones, you know, within 45 minutes, we had our first bullet. After about five hours, we had about 70 bullets, fragments or casings or other, uh, I would say things like we had one button that had two holes and not four. We found a nickel from 1946. Um, one of the most important things we found besides those two items, we found a shell, um, shotgun shell, that was encased in cardboard, not plastic. Hmm. They started using plastic in 1950, so it did predate 1950. Can't swear that it was 1946, but I can tell you it's before 1950. Um, and then we had a computer program that Georgia state used that showed everything we found where it was in the ground. And most of them were straight down, not at an angle. And the reason that's important is because the FBI said they thought people were just out there target practicing. Well, you don't shoot straight down in the ground. If you're target practicing, I mean, this ain't a cartoon. It doesn't, <laughs> you know, change direction and go straight in the ground. Right. And if you shoot somebody, they're not going to remain standing more than one or two shots. Right. So you're going to walk over and shoot right over them, you know. So um, we turned everything over to the FBI except for a few artifacts like the button and the, the nickel and a few other things. But the FBI, you know, came and got it. And again, with this case, you know, I don't ever rule out a deathbed confession. It can happen. Somebody mm -hmm. wants to make things right before, you know, they meet their maker. And the other thing is you have the possibility that the person that was on that bridge has told their children yeah. and handed down that weapon. Let's cross check that weapon. Right. We got striations, you know, it could happen. When we did this case, um, I think that was 2010 and a few of the people that were involved, believed to be involved, were still alive. Whoa. You know, but what happened so. in 1946 after the, sh the murders? Oh, man. Um, was there just no investigation? Was there? Oh, there was. Um, but again, it was 1946, and it was sharecroppers versus the yeah. word of a yeah a rich farmer. Um, and I can even send you, if you'd like to look at them, some of the um, photographs that were taken even at the time where, you know, the sheriff comes out and he's looking and Lord Harrison is just pointing and He's showing how they tied him up with this rope and all this sort of thing. I mean, the sheriff's not even wearing a gun. Now, if you've just had four people killed, uh, where's your gun? And when he was asked about it, he said, somebody borrowed it. And I don't remember who. Really? So somebody borrowed it on the bridge? I mean, that's what you're inferring. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I mean, it was it was not a great time. But I mean, the GBI was involved. The FBI was involved. I think the FBI offered... $35,000 reward, which at the time that was a fortune. Um, but they knew nobody was going to come forward because yeah. who was going to come forward? You know, the, the whites weren't going to come forward because they were going to implement somebody they were related to. And then they would be run out of town if they were lucky. 
they would have been killed themselves. Well, the black community certainly ain't going to talk because they're going to have the same fate. Right, right. So you have two people, two groups of people in complete silence, you know, to save their own lives. And that's, you know, unfortunately how it went. But it, it was a famous case. I mean, even the president of the United States commented about it. But I'll tell you one cool thing. Tyrone, when he came to me, he said, listen, this is the reason the Morris Ford Bridge case is important to me. He said, Dr. King was in Macon, Georgia, and said, when, you know, at the end of, you know, April, 1st of May, I'm going to the Morris Ford Bridge and I need all y'all to come with me. And the last thing he said in that pulpit was, when I get back, right? Well, of course, he was assassinated. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Um, so Tyrone said, this is why it is so important to me. Right. So that is so profound. And I can't believe I'd never heard historically of that that event. I have to ask you one thing before you go that I ask mm -hmm. uh, my guests at the end of interviews. And it's, you know, we've talked a lot about justice directly and indirectly. Mm -hmm. In your own words, how do you define justice? Justice is case by case. For example, with the school mass shooting that just happened in Texas, are those mamas and daddies ever going to get justice? No, because for me, justice makes something right almost. It's like, yes. you know, there's this unjust that has occurred and we're going to do something about it. Well, you have children. I have children. If somebody were to take one of my children, there is absolutely no punishment that would ever suit that person because no. what they have taken from me I mean obviously cannot be replaced but it also cannot be avenged it cannot be corrected with prison it couldn't be corrected with the death penalty right. if I got to shoot them it would almost make everything more horrible so again I think it's a case by case and sometimes the justice has to come from you and that sometimes looks like um you know when you can look at that person and forgive them i think mercy can flow out of justice sometimes amen yeah sure. yeah sure Cheryl, I might need you to come back on the podcast for part two. I feel like you have more <laughs> stories that I want to hear. Oh, honey, I got stories. <laughs> I got good stories. I just can't thank you enough for your time and your work. Uh, it's it's just a gift. And um, thank you for sharing it. Thank of you for course. being on Dialogue. Uh, it was an honor for me. And I just had to tell you how sexy you look in that shirt. <laughs> oh, I'm going to, I'll post it. And thank you for it. It's my colors. It's hot pink. I'm a oh, fan. It's beautiful. It's and beautiful. I'm, I'm such a fan. <laughs> thank you again for killing the small talk and just have a beautiful night. And um, thank you for being here. Absolutely. Thank you. Honey. Dialogue is a yellow tape media production, audio engineered by Jason Usri and produced hosted and edited by me, Rebecca Sebastian. If you love the podcast, please consider becoming a diehard by signing up at patreon.com slash dialogue. Other ways to support the show? Follow along on social media. We are at Dialogue Pod across platforms, and you can now watch most episodes on YouTube by subscribing to my channel, Rebecca Sebastian. For more information or to drop me a note, visit RebeccaSebastian.com. Until next time, thank you for listening and killing the small talk.